Thank you very much. Um, because this is Memorial Day, Pastor Matt asked me to uh, to share some perspectives, some observations that I've had over the, over the years. And having started a program called Honor Flight, I have heard literally hundreds and hundreds of stories, and some of these um, touched me at my soul. So I really struggled this morning sharing them with my wife. So. Please bear with me. The first story, uh, very, very personal. I was 10 years old. My dad was in the Air Force, and we were stationed at Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho. And we were there for three years. So it was a DOD school, Dodd's school, because Mountain Home was in the middle of nowhere. So any kid on that base went to this school. And their parents were serving in the military, and It was 67, 68 during the Tet Offensive, and my dad was over in Vietnam at the time. And I'm 10 years old, and I'm praying every day that my dad would please make it home. Because you always hated it. You always hated it. Anybody hear me? Okay. You always hated it when the principal would come down to the classroom. And the principal would poke their head in and motion to the school teacher to come out into the hallway. They'd go out in the hallway. And then the teacher would come back in the classroom, and she's crying. And the principal would say, Bobby, Julie, uh, why don't you go ahead and come forward? Where's your coat? Uh, your lunch? Did you bring your lunch? Why don't you come on forward? No, you can leave your books in your desk. Come on up here. And you wouldn't see Bobby or Julie ever again. Because their dad was shot down. Their dad wasn't coming home. That happened to me twice. As a 10-year-old kid sitting in school. And I still shudder when I think about that school principal coming into the room. But praise God, my dad made it home. And in this room right now, we have veterans that praise God, you made it home. And uh, as a family member of a Vietnam veteran, you have no idea how grateful we all are for that. I was on another on a flight trip with uh, this World War II veteran who's sitting there, and as these veterans go into the World War II Memorial. They're thinking about a lot of things. They're thinking about their friends that never made it off the ship. They didn't make it out of the plane. They didn't make it onto the beach. They're thinking about their friends. And in this one particular instance, this veteran was thinking about family members. And he shared with me how being raised in Kentucky, he was raised in the Hollers. And back in the day, of course, if somebody died, no, you didn't have a chaplain. You didn't have a chaplain and, and two officers that went to the person's house. It was Western Union. And he said, I'll never forget uh, Western Union. You didn't like to see them drive by. Uh, there was no phone, no cell phones. Most people didn't even have a phone. He said, but uh, the Western Union guy would go by, and he said, there was this scream in the holler that went up when a mother was told that uh, she lost her son. And he said, that scream still haunts me to this day. It echoed throughout the entire holler. Everybody knew instantly that so-and-so wasn't coming home. All those hopes, all those dreams, all those ambitions for the, evaporated. He said, I cannot get that scream out of my head. Over 418,000 Americans died during World War II. That's a lot of screams. 
Over 58,000 Americans died during the Vietnam War. That, too, is a lot of screams. 36,000 during the Korean War. So tomorrow is Memorial Day. Please take a moment to not just honor the military members that didn't come home, but also their families that had to endure. You might be asking, well, was it worth it? Was everything worth it? I mean, that's so much horrific pain and, and suffering. We're getting ready to get on uh, the bus. We're at the World War II Memorial. To answer this question, was it worth it? So getting World War II veterans and Korean and Vietnam veterans back on the bus is like herding cats. It really is. Good on the bus. Hey, the, we're, missing, we're missing two veterans. So the search went out around the World War II Memorial, looking for two World War II veterans. And sure enough, there they were, but they were surrounded by 20, 30 school kids. And that eighth grade field trip, uh, where the eighth graders were in Washington, D.C., and they're all wearing the same colored shirts, they were all around these two World War II veterans. And they're exchanging, they're talking and talking. And it was so wonderful because I had to go grab them get them on the bus because there's some hard time hacks. Believe it or not, getting to the airport in time is not the most important time hack because the plane waits. <laughs> Let me tell you who doesn't wait. The tomb guards at the, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier during the changing of the guard. They're not going to wait. And that was our next step after World War II Memorial. So I said, get on the bus. We need everybody on the bus. And you hate to pry these veterans away from these kids because they're never going to get that level of admiration ever again. And those school kids were just like in awe that they were talking with World War II veterans. So get on the bus. <laughs> Do not make me take off my belt. Get on the bus. I'm pleading with you. Get on the bus. So we're just about ready to leave. And this one school kid goes, sir, do you mind if we pray with you? I'm like, oh, man. It's one of those schools. They weren't all wearing uniforms. It threw me a curveball. I went, oh, for crying out loud. <sighs> so they all gathered around. Some were holding hands. Some of them had their hands on the World War II veterans. And it was really a nice prayer. It was, it was kind of sweet. I felt kind of awkward for them because I didn't even know if they were spiritual, right? So finally, I grabbed them away, and we're walking, and we're walking as fast as I can with 80-year-olds to the bus, and I said, look, man, I'm so, I had no idea who they were. I had no idea they were going to do that. I said, I, I want to apologize if they made you feel un un awkward or uncomfortable. They said, no, no. And they stopped, and they looked at me, and the one veteran goes, that didn't make us feel uncomfortable. He goes, that's one of the things we were fighting for. We are gathered here today in this building because of one of the things that they were fighting for. We have Pastor Matt here who's given us the word. A lot of people died so that this can happen all across this great nation of ours. So when we remember our veterans tomorrow and their service and their sacrifice, you got to take the good with the bad. This is the good. This is just one of the many, many goods is freedom of religion. Let's not take that for granted. Thank you. Worth it. And uh, it, it just reminded me of, we had a, a men's um, conference here that we, we televised and did it here. And there was a, a speaker, um, his name was uh, Chad Robichow. And he was a uh, Marine Force Recon. And he was talking about how um, they went and they got a bunch of people out of Afghanistan when that whole thing happened and we withdrew a bunch of people. Um, and somebody had asked somebody there, was it worth it? And, and I'll never forget this quote because it's just so powerful. He, the, guys, the guy said, it doesn't have to be worth it to do the right thing. You know, like, and... And that's an amazing thing. So today, when we, we talk about the, the veterans, 
You know, we went over this, this uh, verse, Psalm 82, 3 and 4 is what's with the pen. Um, it says, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. A lot of times I'll hear, we've all heard the argument from people talking about how they don't like the war and the war was unjust and all these different kind of things about different wars. You don't have to agree with the government to honor the American soldier because the American soldier stood up for this very thing. This is what they signed up for. So we can honor that, that they did this thing um, without necessarily having to agree with the government. I'm not saying one way or another on that. I'm just saying you can still honor the American soldier and what they fought for, that they defended the weak and the fatherless. They upheld the cause of the poor and the oppressed. And they very much wanted to go and rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And um, we have those freedoms, just like Earl was saying, because of them. So we are, are very thankful um, for that. We're going to go ahead and pray and get started. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you that um, you brought us all here safely. Thank you for um, a country where we can enjoy the freedoms that we have here, Lord, uh, where we can... We can walk outside and not have to worry about being persecuted or um, people trying to arrest us or throw us in jail because of, because of our beliefs in you, Jesus. Um, I was just reading about the, the tens of thousands of people who are locked, Christians who are locked in uh, North Korean prison camps just because of their belief in, in having a Bible. And we don't have that to worry about. So we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for the freedoms that we have here, Lord. Help us not to take it for granted, Jesus. Uh, we pray as we go over your word today that you would, you would bless the reading of your word, uh, that you would uh, speak to us loudly and clearly, Father. Help us to grow closer to you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Okay, so today we are going to be going over uh, we're going to continue our series on the parables of Jesus. We're going to go over the mustard seed, the leaven, and the treasure. Um, so while I was sitting and writing this sermon, I was in the, the living room. I had my laptop, and um, which I usually don't do. It's odd for me to do that around Jenny and Eliana. I, I'm usually like in my own little place and uh, kind of just spending time with the Lord. But for whatever reason, I was, I was around them and writing this. And uh, Eliana came over and sat on my lap. And she said she wanted to help me write my sermon, so, <laughs> which is funny because there's been times like I'll come here and practice with Jenny on Saturdays, and Eliana will say, sermons are boring. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. But she'll, yeah, yeah, the bluntness of a child. That'll humble you real quick, believe me. Um, so, so Jenny asked her, she's like, well, what do you want to say about Jesus? And she responded with simply, I love you, Jesus. And uh, she said that, you know, and it struck me that that pretty much describes what we're talking about today. See, Eliana's faith starts out as love of Jesus in the heart of just a little girl, right? And as she gets older and gets to know more about God and builds her relationship with him, her faith grows. And it continues to grow, and soon it's going to become one of the most prized treasures she would ever have, something she would never part with. So today, as we continue our sermon series on the parables of Jesus, we're going to go over three different parables. Uh, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, and the parable of the treasure. Uh, the, the passages that we'll be working out of today are in Matthew 13, uh, starting in verse 31. So the reasoning behind preaching these three parables in one sermon is that they go together. They are parables about the kingdom of heaven. They're called the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew. Um, in Mark and Luke, they are the kingdom of God, and there's a purpose behind that. So Matthew was written as a book that Matthew wrote to testify to the Jewish people about who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. So they understood it more as the kingdom of heaven when he wrote this to them, which is also why you will find... Uh, so many genealogies and different things that show that he is the Messiah and where he came from because Matthew's book is intended to 
to bring the Jewish audience to Christ, to let them know that he is the Son of God, he is the promised Messiah that the Old Testament talked about. So it quotes a lot of the Old Testament, and that's why. But the parable of the mustard seed is about the kingdom of God beginning and growing. The parable of 11 talks about how it's grown, and the parable of the treasure talks about the immense value of the treasure of the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew 13, 31 to 33 says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Matthew 13, to 46 is the next parable that we'll be going over today. It um, says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So it's important to remember when reading the parables that these are are short stories meant to convey a spiritual truth, just a simple spiritual truth that Jesus told. They're not meant to be dissected word for word and stretched to find different meanings in them. I say this because I've, I've heard this argument from a lot of people that aren't Christians that will try to say, well, the Bible is not true, because they'll look at it and they'll be like, Jesus said the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. It's not the, the tiniest, the smallest seed there is. So people are like, oh, the Bible's not true because that's not the smallest seed. Are you kidding me? Like people just come up with some, that's not the point. It's completely missing what Jesus was saying in the parable. And the story isn't about, isn't about fact-checking the size of seeds or, or finding a hidden meaning. The parable shows the truth of how the kingdom of God started and grew. And the kingdom of God, it started with one man, Jesus, the Son of God, being born on earth. John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So it started with Jesus, and then it spread to 12 men, the disciples of Jesus, 11 who would go on to spread his message. And this was the plan of God all along, to start the kingdom on earth with just a few men that would go and change the world. Jesus even told them this, but I really don't think that they grasped what he was saying to them. Matthew 4, 18 to 20 says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen, and he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. So these are just ordinary fishermen who would one day be used by the Lord to change the world. And have you guys ever noticed that Peter was probably not even a good fisherman. Like every time that Jesus caught him fishing, he wasn't catching anything. (laughs) And and he was always messing up. Like if, if you realize Jesus was rebuking him constantly, like he was always telling him, no, Peter. He even called him Satan at one point. Get behind me, Satan. Peter even denied Jesus to his face at his time of need. I mean, these were the, about the lowest you can get. And Jesus called them up. And uh, I love that Jesus loves Peter. Jesus loves Peter, man. Like you read it, he just, he loves Peter. And it just gives me hope for me. Because I, like, I'm more of a mess than Peter was. Paul says that he was the chief of sinners. Paul has not met me. I'll tell you that much. (laughs) Um, And it goes on to talk about, tell all about the 12. Uh, Matthew 10, 1 through 4. It says, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. 
first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So right here, the kingdom goes from the seed, that is Jesus, to 12. It's already, it's, it's spreading, but it continues to grow even after the death of Jesus on the cross. We go into the book of Acts and we have Peter. And let me remind you again of the humble beginnings. Peter, the rest of the apostles, tax collectors, things like that, uh, zealots who would kill for, the, for um, the Jewish cause that they saw. Like this is what God does. Like Jesus didn't use the, the pretty and the perfect called up the people from the bottom. And he still does this. So if you're sitting here saying, well, I can't be used by God. I'm not perfect or I'm not somebody of stature or anything. Come on, man. All through the Bible, Jesus used the the lowly. I mean, all right. um, Homeless, drug addicted, person is up here preaching the gospel to you as the pastor of this church. What does that tell you? And I just got done telling you I'm a mess. It's not that I'm perfect. It's that Jesus pulls from the bottom to glorify his name. He pulls and uses us that are broken to glorify him because it brings glory to him. But here we have Peter, who, who just denied Jesus to his face just a few chapters ago. We're in Acts now, but if you go back into the, the end of the Gospels, Peter had just denied Jesus to his, to his face, and he just comes and throws down the Gospel. I mean, he preaches fire. Acts 2.36 to 41 says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So you see what's going on here? The seed that was planted is becoming the tree that it was meant to be, and the birds are flocking to it. We go from 1 to 12 to 3,000. And this isn't including all the ones that weren't apostles that started following Jesus when Jesus was on earth. But then when we continue in the parable of the leaven, it goes on to describe how it will grow. In Matthew 13, 33, a passage we just went over, it um, says he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hidden three measures of flour till it was all leaven. So in its simplest form, what does this tell us? That yeast is mixed into dough and it's grown within so the dough is affected by every bit of, of yeast that it comes in contact with. So it is with us and the kingdom of God, right? Like with us, we accept the truth of the gospel and we're changed by it, and we're changed by the Holy Spirit. Little by little, he begins to change us, shape us, and mold us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18 says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. So him working in us like he does, like just like leaven and dough from the inside out is actually doing two things, sanctifying us and shaping us to be more like Jesus. Like that. this is why I can go on and say that I'm a mess and just tell all y'all that I struggle with things 
and I'm a mess because he is shaping me. He hasn't shaped me. I'm not done. He's got a lot, he's got a lot of work to do. Oh, my goodness. Pray for me, y'all. He's got some work to do in me. But he's going to continue to do that. He's going to be faithful to do that. At the same time, I'm light years away from where I was. But, man, I've got a long way to go. God is going to do that. And as he does that, as he shapes, shapes us to be more like Jesus, it has the effect to grow the kingdom throughout the world because us, just like the yeast, are going to affect everything that we come in contact with everything that we touch, when, we're live, when we live our lives out for the, for the gospel, we are going to affect the world. So you remember a few months ago we talked about this. Um, remember when I brought in the lights and we were going over the, the lamp and the stand? Um, that was when I said, I brought in this real bright light and I said, don't look at the light. And then I looked right at the light as I put it down and I couldn't see for like half the sermon. Yeah. Yeah, I told you he's got work to do in me. So, <laughs> but that verse that we have in Matthew five fourteen to 16 says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So as Jesus grows us, as he does this, as he does his work in us, and it, he cultivates this heart of righteousness that loves him and wants to live for him, our light touches everything around us. Not because of, of who we are, but because he shines through us, and it glorifies him. And it's the same way with the, the parable of, of the leaven. The, the yeast in the dough. As the yeast works from the inside out, it causes it to rise. Uh, 1 Peter 2.12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I, I, <laughs> I don't recommend going into a group of people that aren't saved and saying, I'm here to do good work in front of you pagans. It's probably not going to go out, go over very well. But live your faith out. This isn't an excuse not to tell people about Jesus. But this is so that when you do tell them about him, they will listen. If you're not living your faith out in front of others, are they going to pay attention to anything that you have to say? If you sit there and are... Um, staring up and down at men or women that walk in, lusting after them, and telling horrible jokes and acting anything but Christ-like in front of everybody, are they going to listen when you talk to them about Jesus? I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. So live out your faith and love for Jesus in a real way in front of the world. Be like Paul. You could not tear Paul down. You just couldn't. Whatever happened, he had an answer for in Jesus. Like, you could, you could tell him, well, we're going to torture you and put you in prison. You could say, well, to live is Christ. If you tell him, we're going to kill you, to die is gain. What could you do to him? No matter what, he was content in all things. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, snake bit. In Acts, um, Acts 16, 25 to 34, there's a story we're going to go over. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Real quick, he was going to kill himself because in Rome, they were going to kill him anyway. Like if he let all these prisoners escape, they were going to kill the dude. 
So he's like, I'm killing myself before they get to. Um, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So Paul was thrown in jail, and he converted the guard. Like, What could you possibly do to him? He lived out his life singing hymns to God, praying to him in a dark prison cell. And what happened? The light shined in front of men. The, the yeast touched the dough. And it continued to move. He lived for Jesus and it affected the world around him. Do you know why he did this? Because he got it. Paul understood. He knew the treasure that Jesus was. He knew what he had in him. He understood this next parable, and it drove him. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which man, man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this parable is incredibly simple, but I don't think that it's understood the way it should be, the way we should understand it. Nothing you could ever have on this earth is even comparable to being a part of the kingdom of God. Nothing. You see, on that, in that parable, it says, in his joy, he sells all that he has. He wasn't reluctant to sell what he had. He, wanted, he was joyous to give it because what he was gaining was so much more. The man found the kingdom and rushed off happily, happily, to sell everything he had just to keep it. The worth of the kingdom of God is insurmountable. It's, it's the worth of, of knowing and having Jesus, the Son of God, as your friend, Lord, and Savior. Of calling the God of the universe Father. The worth of having the Spirit of God living inside of you. And the worth of calling heaven home. Could you put money on any of that at all? There are no treasures on earth that compare to having him to hold. Nothing. No house, riches, jobs, possessions, power, or fame. Nothing can hold a candle to what we have in Jesus. Philippians 3, 7 through 11 says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It says he counts everything as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. Or other translations would say it when you use this literal word. This is another time that the Bible is whitewashes is whitewashed in modern translations, and I don't get it. Um, and by the way, I was talking about the NIV last week. I use the NIV on a lot of things. 
So I wasn't saying don't use it. Just saying be careful when it comes to how certain things are, are said in there. But this word when he says count everything as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ, it actually says count everything as dung, D-U-N-G, excrement is what it's saying. Everything he lost, that's what he looks at it as. And I think it's important to see it for what it says in this context because it drives that point home even more. It's not just paper you threw away. It's worse. Like, get me away from it. I just want him. And this is what Paul is saying here. Christ in knowing him is the true treasure. And I need you all to hear me on this. No matter what you own, no matter what your future holds, what your past held, no matter what you have or don't have, no matter your circumstances, no matter your financial needs, how far in the hole you are with earthly money or how much you have, if you have Jesus, you are one of the richest people to ever walk this earth. Nothing can take that away from you. Bill Gates, uh, Jeff Bezos, Musk, with all their, their earthly riches, they are beggars compared to what we have in Christ. They might say that they would look, look at people that don't have and, and feel for them. I would say that I would look at you with all you have, and if you don't have Christ, I feel for you. That is the treasure. That is what we have. This point is drove home in, in Revelation um, even stronger. Revelation 4, 9 through 11 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the elders have these, these crowns that Jesus himself gave them in heaven. And they give them back. They stand or kneel before Jesus and say, I don't want it. I want you. Like, I want you. They say, you're worthy, Lord. We don't want these crowns. We have you. What, what is that going to do for me? And though the Bible doesn't specifically say it, I think we're going to do the same thing. I think that, that we're going to be in front of, of Jesus, and we're going to take whatever crown we would have and just throw it and say, I don't want it. I just need you. I just want you. I have you for eternity. I don't care about a crown. And you know, I think I think that is going to be the like we talk about there there's a verse in the in the Bible that says every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And I think that's just the natural the natural response to being in the presence of God. When Jesus comes back, I don't think he's going to force anybody to do anything think they're going to see him for who he is and they're going to bow down and say yes you are you are God I don't think you'll be able to be in his presence and not and I also think that when you see him in all of his glory and goodness and for who he is as perfection in a way that we can't possibly understand on this earth all you're going to want to do is be in his presence which is why I think hell is going to be so much hell because people will stand in front of God, see who he is, and then be denied that for eternity. I think that's the worst part. Crowns, riches, and treasures in heaven, gates made of pearl, mansions, and streets of gold, I think we're hardly going to be able to look at it. We're going to see Jesus, and we're not going to be able to look at, at gold and mansions or any home we'll have him forever and we get to walk with him for the rest of eternity and we'll just throw the crown down just, just give me you 
We just want you. So before, before we close, I want to ask you, do you see him? Do you, do you see him for the treasure that he is? Like, really see him. Do you treasure him? Is Jesus the king that you would sell everything just to have? Is he worth more to you than anything else? If not, the problem isn't with him. It's not that he's not that. It's with our sight. It's with seeing him. You guys know those, those dotted lines on the highway that divide it? Divide the lanes. You guys know how long those things are? I would say three feet. Just looking at them, as you go by, they're 10 feet. 10 feet. But we drive by them so fast that we can't really focus on how big they are. And in the same way, we can live our life so fast that even if you have Jesus, you don't see him for who he is. You don't have or won't take the time to stop and look at him. And, and so you're not seeing him as the treasure he is. And you know, some of these things don't look outright bad. And I think the enemy can deceive us in those ways. He can get us so busy into sowing into things that we forget to look at Jesus. I think sometimes you can get so caught up in doing things for him that you forget just to love him. I don't say don't feel bad about this. It's what we're here for. Like we need, we need the word to align us, to correct us, and to push us forward, right? Times like this, I, I've needed it. Going over the sermon myself, man, I was like, goodness, I... I need to do more of this and less of this. I do that usually about every week. We can go to Jesus right now and be honest with him. And, and let him know that we're, we're not seeing him how he really is, but we want to. And we can ask him to reveal himself to us through his scriptures and through his spirit in such a way that we see him for the treasure that, that he is. So if you, if you would stand with me, we're going we're gonna to pray and uh, be dismissed. As we pray, I just want to ask you to yourself out loud, however you feel like doing it, whatever your relationship is with the Lord and whatever you feel like, how, how you need to do it. I just want to ask you to communicate that to him. Ask him to let you see you for who you for let you see him for who he is. The treasure that he is, the treasure that we have. Can you imagine having a treasure right in front of you and never looking at it for what it was? That can end today, though. It can end before we walk out. So let's let it. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift that we have in you, Lord. Thank you that that you are good and perfect and that we have you for eternity, that you walk with us, that you talk with us, that you hold our hand, that you comfort us when we need it, that you lift us up when we need it. Sometimes, Father, it's just we get so bogged down with doing, doing things that we just forget to look at you and love you and realize how much of a treasure we have in you, Jesus. We just ask that you would remind us, Lord. Just remind us how good you are, God. Remind us that we get to walk with the living, breathing Son of God, not somebody that's sitting in a tomb somewhere dead. We have a real personal relationship with you, Jesus. You're right next to each one of us right now, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you that, that you are always faithful that we'll be in, in times of need and times of loss and we'll just hear those words in our ear that you are there. And sometimes that's all we need, Lord, just a reminder that you are there. So I pray that for my brothers and sisters, Lord. I pray for your peace all over them, Jesus. I pray that this week, as they go about this week, Lord, that they would see you in all things. That they would, be, they would remember that every breath they take is a gift from you. Every day woken up is a gift from you. 
And it's a gift that we can walk out with you, Lord. And we thank you for that, Jesus. I pray for your blessing over my brothers and sisters this week, God. I pray that they would just have a special revelation of how much you love them, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We ask for your protection and your blessing over my brothers and sisters, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed. I love you guys so much.